Our mental vision is often like our physical vision. Our eyes point out, and we tend to focus on things outside as well, especially when things are not going well. We look for somebody, something outside to blame for the problem. And yet, if you have to have the whole world straightened out in order to be happy, well, it would never happen. You'd die first. And as it turns out, that's not where the real problem is. The problem is inside. As the Buddha said, we suffer because of craving and ignorance. And one of the major issues in ignorance is not seeing where we're causing ourselves suffering. When they say ignorance of the Four Noble Truths, that's precisely what they mean. We don't see our own craving, we don't see our own ignorance, and so we keep doing things to cause suffering, and we don't know. Or when we happen to do things right, that we're not causing ourselves suffering, we haven't figured it out why that's happening. We don't see the connections. This ignorance is not all that mysterious. It's the Buddha pointed out to his instructions to Rahula. Lesson one in the Dharma. One, he said, be truthful. And then two, look at your intentions. Look at your actions. Look at the results of your actions. Precisely areas where we don't like to look. It's a lot easier to lay the blame on other people than it is to say, well, maybe something's wrong with our motivation, something's wrong with our intentions. Partly because as children we were taught to lie about our intentions, to get away from being punished. I didn't mean to do it. I didn't think that would happen. Many times you did mean to do it. Many times you did think it would happen, but you can't tell that to your parents, otherwise you get punished. Or we deny that some harm happened because of our own actions. Again, a fear of punishment. This gets internalized. That even when there's nobody standing over us to punish us, we learn not to look on our own intentions. We learn not to look at the results of our actions. As a result, huge areas inside the mind become unknown territory, big blank spaces. And it's precisely those areas, though, that we need to know about if we're going to gain any headway in putting an end to suffering. It's not a question of learning about emptiness or Buddha nature or anything abstract like that. It's just looking, okay, what am I intending here right now? What's my motivation? Looking again and again and again each time, preferably before you act, so you can check yourself in time. And then see what's happening as a result of your action. An important way to approach this is to have the right attitude towards your mistakes. Many times we don't like to admit mistakes, and so that just buries them deeper and deeper in ignorance. But the Buddha, when he was teaching Rahula, taught that you should be open with your mistakes, tell them to other people even. Not to get yourself all tied up in remorse. Because that just makes the problem worse. When you get tied up in remorse, it lowers your energy level, lowers your self-esteem, and it gets harder and harder to decide to do the right thing. When the Buddha sense of what he calls shame over the mistakes you've made is not sense that you should have a low opinion of yourself. Actually, you should have a high opinion of yourself, that you're a better person than that. You're not the sort of person who normally does that kind of thing or wants to continue doing that kind of thing. And you're honest enough to want to look for help. That's why it's best to be open. This is why the monks confess their offenses to each other. This is why the practice is not a solitary affair. You want to learn from the wisdom of others. 
And the best way to do that is to be open. And then you take what you've learned from your own experience, you take what you've learned from the wisdom of others, and try again. Try again. Keep trying. Because if you don't keep trying, then things start backsliding. And this large area of ignorance in the mind just stays that way, stays in the dark. So this is the basic principle in Dharma practice, is you keep looking inside for what's wrong. This doesn't mean there's nothing wrong outside. There's plenty of things wrong outside. But if you focus on them all the time, you miss the areas that you're actually responsible for, which is, what are your intentions? How do you choose which ones to act on? You want to be transparent to yourself in this way. Otherwise, if you keep looking outside, the, as John Lee says, you never see the Dharma. All you see is the world. The Dharma comes from seeing. The Dharma comes from looking inside. It all depends on the directions in which, directions in which your mental eyes are focused. So this is why we meditate, to get more and more sensitive to our intentions and their results. Very simply, focus on the breath. See how long you can stay with the breath. See what other things come up and push you off. And then learn to be quick to come back, and learn to get quicker so that you don't get pushed off. Usually in the beginning this is one of the most disconcerting parts of the meditation, to see how hard it is to stay focused on something simple like this. But it's an important lesson. There are lots of currents flowing through the mind. The Buddha calls them asavas, or fermentations, effluents, things that come flowing out. And if we're not careful, they become floods, overwhelming the mind. You're sitting here telling yourself you're focusing on the breath, and all of a sudden you're far away someplace else. The mind's been flooded. But fortunately, it doesn't have to stay that way. You can pick yourself out of the flood and come back. Keep at this until you find that you can catch these outflows when they're still small, and turn off the spigot. On the one hand, it puts you in the right place to see your intentions, and also gives you the strength to withstand intentions that you might ordinarily give into, as you develop more and more a sense of well-being here with the breath. The compulsion to go after a particular idea or a particular thought or a particular sight, smell, taste, tactile sensation, whatever, gets a lot less when you have a good, comfortable place to stay. It's like the difference of having a good home to stay in as opposed to a really harsh and punishing home or a narrow, miserable home. It's the kids from the miserable homes that are out on the streets. The ones with good homes tend to stay home more. It's the same with the mind. You create a good space inside the mind where you can stay right here, right now. It's easier to stay here. You're more inclined to stay here, and you see more and more of what's going on in the mind. And if you discover there are people dealing in drugs in the back rooms, well, okay, you know now. And you get well enough established here that you can expel them from the back rooms. So that more and more the home, this home of the mind really does become like a home, less and less like a bus station. In other words, you have control about who comes in, who goes out, what happens inside the home. And you get more and more confident in being truthful with yourself. And 
a sense of well-being and develop makes it more and more amenable, nicer to keep focused inside. In the past, when you focused inside, all you saw was a mess, and so you didn't want to look there. But now you look inside, you've got a nicer and nicer place to stay, a nicer and nicer place to look at. Let's get your inner eyes focused in the right direction. Because if you really want to see the Dharma, this is where you have to look. <laughs>